So, our very first speaker uh, is a man by the name of VJ, and um, I met him via, uh, well, I guess I met you Twitter, via, yes. via, via the Twitter storm that happened after this taxi data fiasco, um, <laughs> where, so I, if, you don't, if you don't know the full story, um, I wrote a really awesome blog post a little while ago uh, about my experience foiling data from the, the Taxi and Limousine Commission. And uh, you can read it at chriswong.com. I, I actually show you the, the FOIA request memo that I had to print out and sign my name on. Um, but my experience was, wasn't actually that bad. I, I had to go down with a physical hard drive and get the data. Uh, and then for so long I had it and a bunch of people were coming to the meetup and saying, can I get the data? And everyone was asking for it. And then finally, so many people asked for it. I was like, it's time. I finally, I need to share this data and stop being a, a data hoarder and put it online. And like within like 48 hours, uh, BJ had figured something out very special about this data, and that's what he's going to tell you about right now. Hey guys, how's it going? So, uh, so as Chris said, um, Chris did a great job. He's supporting his, uh, you know, his his uh, his passion in life, which is getting data open, so people can take that data and do awesome stuff with it. And I think as a community, we have to be very um, we have to be very cognizant of all the possible things that could happen, both good and bad, with this with with data that are released. And I think it, it's it's on our shoulders to make sure that the people who work uh, in 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 areas that are responsible for this really understand the implications of what they're doing, so that we continue to have good access to data in the future. So um, I wrote this article on Medium. Um, it was called "On Taxis and Rainbows." It was not. It's a long and complicated story, but rainbows is not actually the right term for what I was doing, but. I really like the title, so I kept it. But I'm, I'm, I'm repairing it. I'm fixing it now. It's on taxis and lookup tables. So um, I'm trying to leave some time at the end for questions. But if you guys have anything that is confusing, let me know, because parts of this are a little technical. All right. So uh, as Chris said, New York Taxi Data was released a while back, thanks to Chris Wong. He did a Freedom of Information uh, request. Uh, it was awesome, 175 million records, 40 gigabytes approximately, something in that neighborhood of uncompressed data. And this is a huge victory for open data because it, it shows all the cool things that the community can do when they get access to data. Uh, but as Chris said, uh, to get it, you had to go talk to Chris, and Chris would copy it to your disk. And this was awesome, but kind of a little bit of a pain in the neck. And Chris had this great idea. He got together with people, put it up on a torrent, down little blanks. This is awesome. All right, the fun has started. So if you look at the data, this is what it looks like. You have. Um, well, first of all, before we even go there, like having access to the data in a in a in a from a resource in a way that you can that everyone on the internet can get access to it easily is something I think is very critical for the open data movement and something I think Chris Chris understands from this and also from the stuff he does as his day job. And I think that's you know there there are multiple pieces that you have to have in order to have a, a functioning ecosystem. And I think the ability to quickly access the data for your own uh, purposes is is really important. So anyway, th the data contain. Um, contain records like this, which is you see some random string, another random string, um, and then a bunch of other stuff. So you can see there's some longitude and latitude stuff in there. There's start and end times. There is like length of, of travel. But I want you to notice the first two columns. You'll see that there are random, random things. And they look kind of like you know, random long characters that make no sense. And, um, and the first two columns uh, are these things. And one is a unique ID for every taxi, and the other is a unique ID for every driver. So, you know, if, if you know New York City, each taxi has an ID, and each driver has an ID. And they probably, you know, they didn't want to want to release all the data with the names of the taxi drivers or the IDs of the taxi drivers, the IDs of the cabs, because maybe, you know, they thought that wasn't a good idea. So they replaced it with this. But you could still track, you know, you could do cool visualizations. You can still track one taxi cab as it does everything, because the same cab has the same number throughout the thing. This is a great idea. It's awesome for visualization. This is exactly what we do. And cool things followed. Um, like, look at this. This is an amazing thing that someone put together. Um, it's, it's beautiful. It shows, I, I had nothing to do with this. I found it on the internet. And you can zoom in and out. It shows all the various taxi routes that have been taken. It's a heat map. It's amazing. Like, people, this is. People keep giving me credit for that. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's awesome, but it's also like, Eric Fisher is. Yeah. Eric Fisher is the man. So this is great. So this shows, this is exactly what we want to have happen with open data, right? Cool things uh, and potentially even things that can be profitable, things that can help people get better access to data. So someone, uh, actually a friend of mine, in fact, Jason, um, on Reddit started, he did a bunch of data processing and he's like, 
you know, this is really weird. I added up all of the amount, all the money made by all the different taxi drivers every day, right? And I sorted, who, who are the most profitable taxi? Look, what, for every day, what's the most profitable, profitable taxi cab? And you look at this, and it's like there is some guy, right, who's making $8,000 a day, consistently is the most amazing taxi driver ever, right? So like, what's going on? Is it some kind of Superman? Like, is he driving at five times the speed? What's going on? And there was rampant speculation. No one could figure it out. And, uh, and, and, so, and so I started looking at it, like, who the hell is this guy? Like, what the hell is going on? So I started with this because I wanted to do a visualization just like everyone else. I'm like, I'm going to look at cool things. I'm going to check out neighborhoods. But then I was looking at this, like, what the, who is this guy? Like, what's going on here? And so years ago, I'd say about eight, nine years ago, I worked at Google. Um, I was building infrastructure internally at Google. And one of the things I built was a system that would... Uh, that would do, that is very complicated. It basically runs on every production machine at Google, and it, it synchronizes files across all these machines. And I had a bug in my code that was really bad. And instead of, instead of checksumming all the contents of the files, it was only checksumming the, the file size, right? But I, didn't, but I didn't remember this. I just looked at this, and I was like, this looks familiar. And it's like, you should, like, a random string shouldn't look familiar. This is like, I'm losing my mind, what's going on? So I tried to think, I was like, where have I seen this before? And then this happened. I was like, I wonder if it's just zero. And I wonder if they're using MD5s. And this is what happened. So it turns out that they're using a hashing function called MD5. Um, does, who doesn't know what a hashing function is? All right, great. Next, next slide, I'll explain it. Um, so they're using a hashing function. Stay with me for a sec. And basically what they did was they took the value zero, and they, they put it through this thing, and then it generated this number, and that's what it is. And that's great. They, they hash all the values. So they took your taxi cab number, they hashed it, generated this random thing. That's great. So this is how they generated these IDs. So what's a hash, right? So this is exactly what you want to know. So a hash, is a, it's a fast one-way function. So it's basically a function, like if you remember from math, there's like y equals x squared. That's a function. Uh, if x is 2, y is 4, right? And the cool thing about that function is if I tell you f of x equals x squared and f of x is 8 or f of x is 16, you can tell me x is 4 really easily. So it's a function, so it's a function like this for every, every time you have a specific input, it always generates the same output. And when you have different inputs, a hash function should generally generate different outputs, right? This is very useful in computer science. It's a ver one of the most fundamental data structures and fundamental algorithms in computer science. So what's special about a hash function? Well, what's, what's special is that going backwards is really hard. And there's, special, there's a whole special class of functions where if I give you some value, you, ha you put it through the function, it gives you an output. If I give you the output, and you don't know anything about the input, it is almost impossible to figure out what the input was. And this is, this is a very important, for various fundamental reasons, it's important computer science uh, property. And so like, if I give you some random string like this, you have no idea what this is. And going backwards is extremely, extremely hard. So there are a number of things. So first of all, actually, MD5 is not a good thing to use for hashing anymore, because MD5 is old, and computers are really fast. So with the, with the modern GPU, you can actually brute force it. So you can actually compute to a certain degree, every possible value within some reasonable amount of time. So, but, but that's not what's wrong with this data. MD5 isn't it. The problem is, if you remember, if you, so if you don't know anything about the input, you cannot go backwards. But if you know stuff about the input, and it's a relatively small range, you can try every possible input and see what the output is. So for instance, if you, if you hash people's names, like John is a pretty common name. So maybe you can just try John and see if that shows up anywhere in the output. And if it does, now you know what this corresponds to. Um, and you can do this for anything you guess. This, you, know, you can get a lot of the data. But what they hashed was taxi IDs and medallion numbers. And that's very, very structured. Um, taxi numbers have four digits or five digits. And five digit numbers always start with a five. And medallion numbers all look like this. So the question is, how many possible taxi numbers and medallions are there? Well, it's only about 20 million. And calculating an MD5 hash of 20 million things on a modern computer is less than a minute. So, um, so uh, yeah, so it's pretty easy, right? So you can build a table that says, for all the possible values, what is the, what is the MD5 hash? And then all you have to do is take that gigantic list and then go compare every value in the entire 175 million line log. And then you can go backwards to the taxi log. And that's a lot of data, but there's elastic map reduce. I rented, I don't know, on Amazon. 10 computers for like an hour. It took only 20 minutes. I didn't optimize the code at all. So in 20 minutes, you can go backwards and you can figure everything out. And here's an example of one of the lines. Those, those things are reversed into the medallion number and the taxi cab license number. And you can do this for the entire, the entire data set. And on top of this, um, there's publicly available information that will, that will map all of the 
uh, taxi license numbers back to the people's names. And because you have the values of every taxi trip, I can actually compute the gross income of every taxi driver in New York City in all of 2013. So this is really easy. And anyone who, who sort of has spent time thinking about this uh, deeply can do this, could do this in like two hours. So what lessons do we have from, from this? from the situation. First of all, never, ever, ever, ever hash to anonymize. You can't do it. It's bad. Um, if you think, oh, I know how to do this. I'm going to hash it. Like, that's probably not the right answer. Um, what you should do instead is, so another way they could have done this is for every taxi cab, you could generate a completely random number and then use that random number for every time the taxi cab is there. And then it would have been impossible to go backwards to the actual taxi ID number. Uh, but e Or you can encrypt it with a secret key. That's more complicated computer science. But basically, it's equally good. Um, but even that may not be sufficient, because anonymizing data is really hard. There, is, there are a bunch of uh, academic papers, I forget the names of the authors, who show that you can actually de-anonymize data relatively easily, even if it has no personally identifiable information. And the London bike data that was released a couple of years ago is a good example. So because they know all the places where people go to and from, they were able to find one person's trips based on timing and all this stuff. So anonymizing data is really, really, really hard. And if you feel like you want to anonymize data, you should probably talk to an expert. There are a bunch of laws on this, I think, theoretically, but no one really knows. Um, we are very lucky that this happened with taxi cab records and not with, for instance, student records. If they tried to anonymize student records like this, it would have been a disaster because you could very easily find the names of everybody, common names of people in New York, and go backwards and figure out who they really are, which that would have been catastrophic. Luckily, here we now know who the taxi cab ID numbers are. That's kind of bad, but at the end of the day, it's kind of not the end of the world. Um, and so we have, to, we have to do things that, that help the people who release this data, sorry, release these data know how to do this properly so that the next time it isn't about something that's more, uh, more important for the privacy world and something that doesn't stop um, the, the movement towards increased open data. So yeah, any questions? Yeah. Um, sure, questions, yeah. OK. It is a privacy issue. I, I don't disagree. It is. But it's much it's less of a big privacy It is a big privacy issue. I have a hack life. Though. Yeah. I don't want to tell you. It's, uh, it's pretty bad. And they released the data. It is a privacy issue. It is still not, it's not, as, it's not as much of it. So if they'd release health records anonymized like this, like the UK is doing, the UK is doing better things to anonymize it. But the UK uh, federal government has released health data records, and they're selling it to companies to do analysis. And there is a lot of concern about, have you actually really anonymized this data correctly? And you know, I agree. It's a, I mean, I would be pissed off if I had a license, too, and if all of my data were revealed. However, at the end of the day, it, you know, it's bad. I don't mean to, to say it's not, but compared to people's private health Health records, it's not as bad in the media. Uh, and and that, the media attention is the thing that can stop the open data initiative. But it, it's a really hard computer science problem to anonymize data. It's not trivial at all. And there are a lot of people who spend you know, their PhD theses doing this. And it, it is a really complicated and challenging problem. And you know, I don't mean to say that the person who did this is like an idiot by any means. It's, it's, you know, if you haven't spent time thinking about it, and if you, ha if you're not, if you haven't worked with people who've explained this to you, it is not at all obvious when you look at this that this is what's happening, right? But it, it, it shows like how, how difficult it is to get this right. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's a side issue here, which is um, the misinterpretation of uh, missing data, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's. You know, that's like, that's like a, you know, there's some data error in your data, right? Well, right, but it came out looking like a person. So like in my line of work, we have a set of supermarket data, and the most popular brand is, or manufacturer is whatever manufacturer happens to have the code 0000. zero, 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 zero. Yep. Because for some reason, these people didn't think to make that say missing. They assigned it to an actual brand, but yeah. it's not an actual brand. It's just whatever sure. you leave it out. Yeah. You might also remember this uh, Pornhub study of pornography habits by state. Hmm. And the most popular state was Kansas. Well, why is that? It's because Kansas is the geographic center of the country. And whatever algorithm they're using when they left out a specific state is just found USA. And then it said, what state am I in? I'm in Kansas. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think that in looking at these things, you have to look at uh, it's not about the privacy side, but the analysis side. You know, what yeah. happens it's, it's, a, it's a very good point. And before you jump to conclusions about data and when things don't make sense, it's 
probably bad data. It's, it's a very good point, actually. It's astute observation. Um, there was someone else had questions. Yeah? Yeah, I have. It's it's two full question. Uh -oh. The first one, what's the uh, political feedback, if I might call it that way? Uh, what's the processing which you'd say, tell them, like, hey, you released that data, but I think it has a mistake and it has something we, we should fix. What's the process to go back to the government so that we don't affect the open that, uh, well, so <laughs> this is a complex. So, they, they read it in the news. Yeah, they read it in the news. Actually, a friend of mine, a friend of mine. So, so there, there are multiple issues. So, if this were, if they, if this data were available, had been available on the website of the city, this would have been. This is a, a little bit of an easier, maybe fix. It's not clear. But the problem is the data. But the data had been distributed, and thousands of people all over the world have this data, mm -hmm. and it is a. You know, it's not. You know, it, it took me like three hours to do this, right? So, so it's not it's not something. It's like anyone who knows what they're doing can do this trivially, uh, and so I think I think in this case it's it's difficult. I, a friend of mine actually used to work at City Hall, and she said that there was someone there who was interested in talking about this. They have it. They don't have a commissioners or something set for the open data. So I, I don't know. So there there may be a way to influence this. I think I think just like more un, more understanding that when you release data that contains information about people. First of all, like, did you really need to release the taxi ID number? Like, why did the, why did the hack license number? I, I could understand the taxi ID number. Maybe you want to see what taxis are doing all day. But why do you care? Like, why are you releasing information about the drivers? That's like kind of strange, right? And maybe you randomize it in a, in a reasonable way, and maybe you don't care. But even if you had randomized it, you know that, you know, taxi driver 47 starts every day at this location in Queens and you know maybe that's his house right and so there's like there are all these algorithms that that you can use to go backwards I the political I, I'm not a political expert I'm a software engineer uh, but I do feel like going and getting people who who sort of see what's going on in the industry um, and and also have an in to the political world you know um, can can definitely make make things fixed in some way so cool hopefully you guys liked it feel free to grab me after if you have other questions yeah. Sorry, that one went.